Hi, everybody. I'm Heise Young. I'm a senior at Duke. Um, I'm part of the Duke students uh, media team, and we're here to answer any questions you guys may have. Um, so I'm going to pass it along so everyone can introduce themselves. Um, Jackson, do you want to go first? Hey, everyone. My name is Jackson. I'm also a senior. Heise and I, we're, we're almost done here. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Jackson. Like I said, I'm a public policy major getting certificates in Arts of the Moving Image and Policy Journalism and Media Studies. We'll talk about what a certificate is, don't worry. I am originally from sort of Peru, sort of DC, and I'm excited to be here to answer your questions today. Matt? All right, hi everyone, I'm Matt King. I'm a senior from Richmond, Virginia, and I study political science, so I'm particularly interested in international relations, and I also studied abroad. So if you have any questions about study abroad, Happy to talk about that process with y'all as well. Hey, everybody. Um, um, hi, everybody. My name is Bob. I'm a freshman here, and I'm intending to major in math and stats. And because I'm just a freshman, so I'm also pretty new here. So uh, I'm willing to answer uh, all type of the questions uh, if I can answer. And um, yeah, nice meeting all of you guys. And just for the record, I am the other half of the Insta team with Haisa, who is who is my better half, uh, at least uh, in the the sense of a professional working relationship. <laughs> um, I like I mentioned, I'm Haisa, so I'm majoring in international comparative studies. Um, I also have a visual media studies minor. I've done a lot of um, things related to fashion and business. Um, I went abroad and I studied abroad in Paris uh, on a petition program, so I can also speak to that um but yeah just send in your questions via the youtube i think there's like a chat in the corner where you can just send in questions um because this is a live chat so we'll be going forward with whatever you guys um ask us um so i guess we could start with um extracurriculars um do you guys want to touch on a little bit of what you guys do uh outside outside of like academic things here yeah i can go ahead and start um so I, like many of my fellow Duke students, love basketball. So here I play, I am in club basketball, and I'm also on the women's varsity practice team. And so a lot, I do a lot of that, but when I came to Duke, I obviously wanted to go to basketball games. And one of the ways I tried to skip the line for this was I signed up to join Duke Student Broadcasting, which is a all student run broadcasting club on campus. We have some really expensive cameras, et cetera. I didn't know anything about cameras, but kind of fell in love with it my freshman and sophomore years. And now what I spend most of my time doing is I'm actually producing a full length feature film at Train Hopper the Movie for any of those of you who are interested. So I spend most of my time making stuff. I like to make videos. I have a drone, but I'm not supposed to. Uh, I don't use it on campus, and I like to just create cool content. So that's kind of a little bit about me. Jackson or Matthew, do you want to go ahead and tell about what you do? Sure. So um, probably the most regular extracurricular activity I do is singing. I'm in Rhythm and Blue, which is a co-ed competitive acapella group on campus. We do a lot of pop music, and we are like big upcoming thing is that we're participating in the ICCAs, which is the same acapella competition that you see in Pitch Perfect. And that'll be, the first round of that is February 17th here in Durham at the Carolina Theater. So um, for those of you who are in the area, we'd love to have your support, but hopefully it's something that you can see in the years to come um, during your time at Duke. And I'm also, I love to write. I used to be a Chronicle columnist and I still uh, write op-eds on the side for the Chronicle, and I'm involved in the program in American Grand Strategy, or AGS for short, which is sort of like the premier foreign policy speaker series and co-curricular program at Duke. It's been an incredibly meaningful extracurricular experience, and uh, I'll actually be going to France and Belgium with the program for a uh, retrospective on 100 years since the end of World War I over spring break. Bob, do you want to tell a little bit about what you do as a freshman? 
Yes, um, for the last semester, which is the only semester I've been here at, at Duke. So basically, I had two major um, extracurricular experiences. One is the DSO, which is Duke Symphony Orchestra. So basically, Duke Symphony Orchestra is like a pretty competitive group. So that basically just people getting there and have, having auditions. And the, um, and the rehearsals there is pretty intense. Like people just do the sight readings like real fast. And uh, usually they have like a, like one performance per two months. So you got to be there and a really shared experience with all the super great violinists and super great musician instrumentalists um, on each Monday and Wednesday, which is a pretty good experience. And the second major um, extracurricular experience is like, because I'm an international student, like a, like a Chinese international student. So on campus, you usually have those um, cultural groups. Like um, as for me, it's, it is Chinese Students Association. And you um, basically just because it's kind of cultural, so people are just doing kind of like cultural stuff and bringing like international cultures onto the entire campus, like sharing international foods and sharing um, tea culture, whatever, just many different variety of stuff that people are really interested in talking about and sharing their innate experience with. And uh, if, uh, if you are also international students, please join in those uh, please, it's highly recommended for you to join those type of extracurricular groups. It's really helpful and really enjoying experience. Thanks, Bob. Okay, so we're having a couple of questions come in about probably the most important thing that happens on campus, uh, food. So, um, Benisha Patel, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing, um, is asking uh, that she has heard the food is good, but how good? Um, so I guess I can say as a senior, uh, marketplace was not renovated when we were freshmen um, and now the food is way better than when we were freshmen. Uh, we also have this massive uh, building called West Union that um, everyone else can kind of speak a little bit more to if they would like. Um, does anyone want to take this question? Oh, so Marketplace, just for everyone's on the same page, is the first year dining hall on East Campus. So, um, and so, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm down to just talk about the freshman meal plan because I think it's actually amazing and it's kind of complicated. So here's what you're getting into. Marketplace is a godsend and is a heavenly sanctuary on East Campus where all the freshmen live. And Marketplace is a collection of different kinds of food. So there's like a grill, there's a salad bar, there's a pasta station, there's a like a stir fry station and they have, they have all kinds of variety every day and you can get kind of whatever you want and all only freshmen eat here with a few exceptions and freshmen have all their breakfasts here and they have all their dinners here and like it's open for lunch but anyone can eat there for lunch and it's all you can eat and you have so they've changed it. Hayes and I was talking about how they've changed Marketplace since our freshman year. That's true. They've renovated the building. It's much nicer now. They've also added more meal swipes, meaning so you get five breakfast swipes each week, which you can use Monday through Friday. And if you miss breakfast, then you can use that swipe for what's called equivalency. And that equivalency goes to becomes food points, which you also have a, another supply of that you can use to at Marketplace or at other vendors. I think we have almost 30 across campus. And then you have dinner. So at lunch, you can eat anywhere on campus. You, again, have like a set amount of food points and you can spend however many you allow yourself to spend a day. And you can get everything from burgers on West to uh, ginger and soy to Indian food to sushi. We have sushi on campus. Uh, it's pretty awesome. And you can order food from various Durham eateries. Durham's one of the best food foodie cities in the world, according to some magazine. And you can, so that's like lunch. And then dinner and brunch on the weekends, which is from 10 to 2, is awesome. Again, you have, Bob, is it 9 or 10 dinner swipes? Uh, I'll let you go ahead and take over the dinner portion of eating. I think it's 9 usually. Great. So, you get nine swipes that you can allocate between seven dinners throughout the whole week and two brunches. So basically, you'll never miss a meal. And what's great about Marketplace is all of your friends eat there. 
um, because freshmen have to eat there. So you can walk in without dinner plans or without breakfast plans and run into 10 people you know. It's a great place to meet someone. It's a great place to catch up with your friends after a day of classes and learning on West. Uh, can someone speak more to what West Union is or um, like what is the proper term? Broadhead Center of um, something, something. There's a, it's a, it used to be called West Union <laughs> and we broadhead, got a new name Richard, because we, ha we have a new president. Broadhead Center for Student Life. Um, so basically, yes, either one. Duke um, renovated the old dining hall on West Campus and into the Gothic architecture inserted a giant glass cube. And that cube is home to nine, I think it's nine or 11 restaurants. Um, they're very good. They range from basically this pub that's in the bottom, the basement called the Devil's Craft House that is great for like hanging out with friends, getting burgers and, and fries. Uh, if you're over 21, you can order alcohol there. Um, and it's great for watching sporting events. We also did, like last year, a presidential debate watch party series there. So it has this great sort of collegiate atmosphere. Um, but as Jackson was saying earlier, there are all these different restaurants like Ginger and Soy, Kyotaku, which is the uh, sushi place. You have JB's, a steakhouse. You have the commons, the faculty commons up at the very top center, which is a great place to flunch your professor. Every Duke student has a hundred dollars uh, given by Duke student government every semester to take their professors to lunch. And ever since the Broadhead Center opened, the Faculty Commons has become one of the choice locations to flunch your professor. They have a great buffet lunch that is really a hit. So um, that is one of the many res restaurants at um, the Broadhead Center, and that has become sort of like the place to get lunch on West Campus, although there remain some really great eateries in the graduate schools. I love the Law School Cafe and the Divinity School Cafe. Both of them are superb and a great way to get some variety in um, your meals. So I've been very happy with the food here. I've been very well fed, and there are also a lot of healthy options, including um, farm to table and vegan options at uh, West Union as well. Yeah, I mean, as a freshman, I'd also like to speak a little bit about West Union. It's quite an experience and quite amazing that, like, we usually call them as, like, eateries, like, um, cafeteria, but actually it's not actually the case for West Union because West Union really looks like it, it gives you so much uh, flexibility and variety of food. It's not like just, like, a swipe or something that you have, like, certain, like, like uh, you have to go there and buy certain food or, uh, accept a certain type of food for each day. They have like a entirely planned out stuff for you for you guys to enjoy. However, Western is like this, and you have like uh, a food point for yourself, and it's everything just based on your own opinions. If you want to try something different, then you can definitely try something different. And the only thing that you need to worry about is just um, not to over not to over waste your um, um, your food points. And also one thing I want to mention so much about is like West Union, they have so many like different type of food. Like you have those Italians, those Indian, which is my favorite. And also the, the Asian bar, which is called ginger and soy, right? Yes. And um, so basically because I'm a Chinese, so sometimes the dairy stuff is too heavy for me. And uh, especially like some very cheesy stuff is really, really killing my stomach. So I want to change my appetite. So I just go to Ginger and Soy and buy something cool. And like, it really gives you so much flexibility to, tr to try out everything. I, I have to say that for the four years in, at Duke, you won't get bored of anything because like, and all the, and literally all the cafeterias, they are not just like, um, not just West Union, like everyone is still innovating new stuff. And like in Marketplace, just yesterday, they are still inventing, uh, inventing a new type of soup that you can definitely try, which is super cool. So yeah, the dining here is just entirely awesome. Perfect, thanks, Bob. All right, we're gonna move on to study abroad questions. Um, so we were asked, um, do you Wait, pay sorry, the same? Real quick, oh, go. Jackson had yes. something to say. Oh, right, sorry, go ahead, Jackson. Wait, you're muted. I just wanna reiterate that if you're, all, if you're at all concerned about the food, you shouldn't be. Daily meal, I'll repeat that, daily meal, 
ranked us uh, number one in the country for dining. So if you're hungry, which I currently am, and we're talking about food a lot, so I'm probably going to go to one of our 30-plus eateries on campus right after this. Don't be excited about be excited about coming to Duke because we've got some food for you to eat. <laughs> Thank you. Very helpful. Um, do you pay the same tuition when studying abroad, or is it more expensive? Um, so I'll touch on this. It really depends on what program you're doing. Um, so, for example, uh, we do have a lot of Duke in programs, which um, I think Matthew or Jackson will touch on a little bit later. But we also have a lot of programs that you can do through other schools and universities. Um, so uh, there, are, most of them actually end up being cheaper than Duke. So. Uh, a semester bought sometimes comes out as cheaper, depending on if you travel a lot, then maybe it doesn't, because um, then you're spending a lot more money like doing fun things. Um, but also, like there are some programs, like I think NYU programs, like in Florence or around the world, are typically more expensive. Um, and I think it ends up being maybe because of where they put the students and like what type of residence homes they have. Um, and then the next question was: Is it normal to study abroad during the summer, or do students? usually go during the semester. Anyone want to take that? Yeah, I can take it. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So students do both. Um, I'd say that the typical progression is if you want to study in a summer, you'll do it after your freshman year or after your sophomore year, usually. The Duke and Oxford program is very popular after freshman year, particularly for people who want a really intense academic experience and to work um, on their writing because Oxford has the tutorial system, and so it's a very rigorous way to improve your writing, working one-on-one -on -one with a professor or a grad student, um, writing papers every week. That, that's a, a popular program for some. Um, but just to reiterate what Haisa said, we have three kinds of abroad programs at Duke. You have Duke in programs, um, which also may be domestic, so it's more of a study away instead of study abroad. Um, you have Duke approved programs, which are through another institution. And Duke has already gone through the process of saying, okay, these programs, we support them. It's okay if our students study at them. And there are already uh, transfer credits available from those programs. And then the third type are petition programs. And Hayes and I both did petition programs. And um, for those last two types, the Duke approved and the petition programs, there is a $4,500 study abroad fee that is added to the, the cost of the tuition of those programs. But for, at least in my case, studying abroad in Cameroon through uh, an SIT program, the cost was actually lower, um, even with that fee added, than the um, alternative of a semester at Duke. Um, all of this is on the Duke Global Education website, and I would refer you to that for more information. But if you already want to, already excited and you want to start planning how to study abroad, you should definitely check that out. Um, but to answer the original question, um, it's very common to study abroad during the summers and also common to study abroad during the year, especially junior fall. That's the most popular time. But Haisa and, and I both broke that trend and went abroad junior spring. And it was just as easy and fun for us as well. Um, Matt, can, before we move on to Duke in programs, can you tell a little bit why you did a petition program and how sure, that process so was like? Like a quick definitely. overview. I. Um, I knew that I didn't want to go to Europe for my study abroad, and I had had a professor who started to mentor me, and, and I took an interest in African studies at Duke, and we had a professor who was, um, for 25 years, a foreign correspondent for French newspapers in sub-Saharan Africa, and he um, had just sent several students of his past students and his son on this one program in Cameroon. And um, he said, this would be a great fit for you. I really encourage you to apply. And the more I looked at it, the more I saw that it had a lot of the things that I wanted in a study abroad program. It had host families. It had language immersion. It had the chance to do my own research. It had um, even weekend outings organized by the program and homestays in different parts of the country. And so I thought, well, this is a great way to work on my language skills and to see a part of the world and truly live in it that I may not be able to see um, just by being a tourist. And so I, um, that was my reasoning for doing a petition program. And then basically what I had to do was to fill out a lot of paperwork and to meet with 
um, the directors of undergraduate studies in various academic departments to get transfer credits. But it all worked out. I um, successfully got all the transfer credits. It takes more initiative, I will say, on the student's part, but is very doable. And the Global Education Office has dedicated staff who will help you and root for you throughout the process. So um, I definitely recommend doing it. If you find a program that you think is an excellent fit for you and is a compelling um, part of, of your personal growth and your academic growth. Awesome, couldn't have said it better. Um, do you wanna touch on Duke and programs, Jackson? Yeah, hey, so I can do that. So Matt kind of mentioned three methods of studying abroad, Duke in programs, uh, Duke approved programs, and petition programs. I would actually, I like to add a fourth category, which are Duke engage programs. And we can talk about those more a little bit too, but that's a, it's, well, it's not strictly studying abroad. It's a method of experiential learning where you spend eight to 10 weeks in a country working there in some sort of service learning capacity. So that's another way to travel. But we'll, we'll circle back to that if there are questions on it. I'll talk specifically about Duke in programs. Duke Global Ed administers nearly 50 of its own Duke run programs where Duke professors go with you or are already there in the established city. And these are mostly abroad. We have ones in, in France and Germany and London. And I personally participated last, last spring, um, as my junior spring, in LA. Uh, Duke has a program called Duke in LA and it's very much a Hollywood immersion program and that is the best, that was the best fit for me. I, like I said at the beginning, have an interest in content creation and found that immersing, immersing myself in that environment was the most conducive to my future. I had also never spent significant time on the west coast. It was an amazing decision. I met, so 15 other Duke kids went with me we became incredibly close during the course of the semester. I had an internship at Cross Creek Productions, which is there's a really relatively well-known production company that did movies like Black Swan and Everest, and met again a bunch of really. I met the guy at Netflix who's a Duke alum who is in charge of original series at Netflix. So he oversees everything from House of Cards to Stranger Things. So meeting alums like him. Were awesome. I highly Perfect. recommend um, Duke and L Duke programs. Go ahead. Um, and then I think the next question we have is um, from William J L K L. Um, I love the look of Duke covered in snow. So do we, as our Instagram shows. <laughs> Does that happen often? I'm from Maryland, and I really like a good winter. Can I touch on this. I guess I can speak to it. Um, in the four, I guess almost four years that I've been here, we every year we do have uh, some snow days um, and we do get a little bit of snow, but it is not, we're, I mean, we're not a Northern school, so we're not covered in snow for a very long period of time. Um, oh wait, no snow days last year when we were all abroad, <laughs> apparently. Um, but it is a really nice thing to have every once in a while, but it, it part of like the appeal of coming to Duke is that we're not fully in the North. So we do get a lot of more sunny weather. Um, so that is like a bit of like what the weather is like here. Touch on like how they feel. Oh, go ahead, Jackson. But when, when it does snow, it is beautiful. Like the, uh, like William asked. And I think everyone really like there's a bunch it, it's this cool dynamic that happens on campus because you have all your like new jersey northerners like snickering at the people in the south who have never been able to deal with a snow day before but it's really much just a community bonding experience and i would say you, our freshman year we got a ton of snow this year we got a ton of snow so i think you can count on one or two snow days a year to really sit back and enjoy the four seasons of north carolina Uh, yeah, I definitely appreciated that, um, having seasons. I'm from Florida, so we don't have seasons. We have hot and then less hot. Um, so we have a question about questions about the transition from high school. I was adjusting from high school to university hard. What is the best way to meet new people? Wow, okay. Uh, let's do one at a time. Uh, Bob, do you want to take the first question? How, does, how was adjusting from high school to university? It was really hard. Um, 
I mean, as for me, it is pretty hard. The transition is like a pretty complicated process, but um, especially like um, I'm not very sure about like how the like how the high school system in America and other places works. But as for me, it's quite different because college itself is really flexible and really gives you a lot of freedoms to like um, give you tons of like choices that you can actually pick. And I don't know, like high school, like comparably it's like more limited. So basically, and you are, this is definitely sometimes like the first time for a person is to go out and um, to be really independent, to be really independent and to be a um, real adult for yourself. So um, it is pretty, um, it is pretty shocking that the first semester I think I came here and I felt quite, um, quite shocked and, and a little bit worried about like, uh, how do I fit into this community? How am I going to take care of myself? And uh, well, yeah, just many things that you have to worry about. And also, I'm not sure if for international students, it's also even pretty harder for us to like um, come here and to fit into this uh, fit into this community. But that usually is, um, but that actually is only the case for the first semester because everyone needs sometimes to get into the new environment. But later on, after the first day, like everything will just get better. So it's a process, um, and um, people, um, it's better for people just to feel relaxed and uh, to meet the challenge they are going to meet. And uh, hopefully, during, like after one semester, everything is going to be turn out to be so fine. Yeah, and um, also I want to speak a little bit about. Do, I, do you mind me to talk a little bit about the? Um, about the classes transition? The no, go level. ahead. Yeah, tell us how hard they are or how hard they're not. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, so it really depends because, you know, college is like very, um, it's like very different. You got so many different choices. Um, so I know some students, I know some of my friends in my classes, they are like very good at math when they are, when they are still in China, when they are still in China. And they came here, if they take, uh, if they take those, um, you know, like quantitative studies, like computer science, and uh, some other like mathematics. It's definitely easier for them to do those um, to do those um, uh, classes, uh, which is usually regarded as pretty hard for our, some other students. However, for them, like qu qualitative and literature, history, those quite uh, this kind of humanity classes are usually hard for them. So basically, um, if you pick your, if you pick your uh, classes in a pretty um, intelligent way and um, you definitely it's definitely acceptable level of difficulty and you will definitely weather through all the, all the difficulties um, you're gonna meet and however just one thing I want to talk about is like usually it doesn't really matter if the class is very hard or not because you come here you come to Duke just because you want to challenge yourself to learn as many different things as possible not to just like limit yourself in one or two specific area that you have been always good at to try something different. Yeah, so just, yeah, just still feel relaxed and take as, take whatever and study whatever classes you want. It's not gonna be a problem. Thanks, Bob. I'm gonna circle back Easily. just again to the transition from high school to college. So for me, one of the things that was most helpful with that, so to, to a little backstory, I went to high school in Peru. I had never been in North Carolina, not before I had applied. I, I didn't tour Duke. I didn't go to Blue Devil Days. I highly recommend everyone goes to Blue Devil Days, but in my case, it just wasn't feasible. So what helped make my transition really easy was doing a pre-orientation program. And pre-orientation programs are, they vary in length from like six to 14 days. They're programs where you participate with other freshmen and a few upperclassmen to do something fun to get to know some Duke students before you really get underway with classes. And this takes place before what's called O week or orientation week of your freshman year. So I did P Wild, which was two weeks hiking in the woods with about 75 other freshmen and 40 upperclassmen from ranging from sophomores to seniors. And we were divided into groups of 10 where we had eight freshmen and two upperclassmen leaders. Well, actually we're groups of 12. It's a little complicated, but basically it's mostly freshmen with a few upperclassmen leaders. And we went to Pisgah National Forest, which is a, uh, a national park in North Carolina uh, on the west side in the mountains. It's where Hunger Games was filmed. And we hiked around and this was something that for me was 
knew I had never really spent significant time outdoors, but college is all about trying new things. So fully embraced it, met some of my absolute best friends, some of the people that have had just the absolute biggest impacts on my life. And I hit the ground running in college because of them. I came in newing upperclassmen. So I had those people to talk to if I was stressed or like needed advice on everything from classes to extracurricular things. And then I had other freshmen like me who had gone through that program, who I kind of had that common bond with, and we've become very close over our four years. They're still to this day, you know, January, what is it, 20th of 2018, some of my closest friends. So that was one of the things that I think helped make a transition to Duke much easier. Matt, I don't know if you want to talk about just structuring your time at all. Um, could you yeah. also touch on um, what, how you met people and how you made new friends at Duke, Matthew? Sure, I'll touch on both. Um, so I think that for me, my situation was a little different because the transition to Duke academics was pretty straightforward. In my case, I was lucky to go to a very rigorous, very intense public high school. And Duke academics are kind of like, for me at least, like it was a very easy transition there the the difficulty in the transition was that my time was far less structured because when you're in high school you're in class like 40 hours a week or at least 35 hours a week and then you have like time after school it's usually very structured around homework meals extracurricular sports um and sort of regimented and then you come to college and you have to discipline yourself and figure out how to structure your time because you might only be in class for 10 hours a week or 15 hours a week. And then the rest of that is like big blocks of time. And then you're also meeting people, right? And so you're getting lunch with them or getting breakfast with them or dinner with them. And the best advice I got freshman year on time management was from my academic advisor, my pre-major advisor, find big blocks of time and honor them. So carve out three or four hours that you're going to dedicate to your homework put your headphones in, do whatever it is that helps you focus, and then just work. And then you can go and do your social things or other things. But, you know, turn your phone off, turn off your notifications, tune out the distractions, work intensively. If you can, work during the day. Uh, if you have, you know, afternoon classes, work in the morning. If you have morning classes, work in the afternoon. So it doesn't have to be all at night. Um, so that was the biggest difficulty for me, was figuring out how to structure my time and how to manage all the free time that I suddenly had coming to college. To answer the second question, how do you meet new people? There are a lot of different ways. Um, I love the openness that exists on campus around orientation week or O week for short. And the first month, people will just introduce themselves like on the bus to you. And it's really sweet and kind of innocent. And it goes away after a time, even though I really wish that it didn't. Um, because that, that was a way that you could just meet people. I, I think I met Haisa like in line at Marketplace or uh, like at the gym or something. So the, like you'll just bump into people randomly. And the nice thing about East Campus is that it's small, it's self-contained. You'll have your 1,700 people um, or so in your class who um, that you know and you see all the time that you wave to. And that is really nice. Um, and that also brings me to dorms. So dorms are another way that you um, will meet people and you'll have house councils, you'll elect people that you think are real go-getters in your dorm to throw events for you. And um, that's a great way to meet people as well. Also, there's an activities fair during the first week of classes where you can meet people um, and they, you know, you'll meet upperclassmen who are passionate about some of the things that you're passionate about. And then there are also, you know, if you're into religious life, there, there's an organization for um, just about every major religious group. And so you can, um, you can join those organizations. There are also cultural or affinity groups um, like the Black Student Alliance, the uh, Asian Students Association. Um, and so those are also ways that people find belonging at Duke. Um, 
thanks, Matthew. So uh, now we're gonna transition to discussing dorm and residence hall living. Um, so I think each of us can speak to the different ways you can live on campus throughout your four years. Um, we'll start off with Bob telling about um, freshman year and what it's like to be on West, and then we'll go to everybody else and where their various living situations are. Um, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, so basically like Duke is a huge campus. Um, and we usually just divide them into three parts, east, central, and west. And as a freshman, it's, it's usually like everyone, just all the freshmen will go to the east campus where you have so many pretty awesome dorms over here. And uh, I don't understand why all the um, fr freshmen are all living on east campus, but it is quite experienced because here, like on the East Campus, you have you have the orca you have the orchestra, the concert hall, uh, which is called Baldwin, and you also have the music department right here. So actually, as for me, it is pretty artistic. Uh, it's a pretty artistic place, and got so many facilities. And also for those dormitories, um, yeah, there are many different dormitories, and also with different themes. Campus, you have the normal dorms, and also you also have. Uh, the art themed one, which is called pregram, like people in there are usually kind of artistic. They like to play music. For example, somebody are really good at playing jazz. Somebody are really good at singing. And uh, so they, so they actually just uh, ask you whether you want to join when you are wh whether you want to join this art themed house um, during your housing application. If you indicate your interest, then probably you will end up in somewhere like pregram. So you have people all gather together with the same interest and you can play music together, which is pretty awesome. And also because there are also very different ways of living among different people. Somebody like prefer uh, being more social and some other people um, would rather prefer being more academic. So different um, housing, they, all, they also have different vibes. As for me, South, I live in Southgate and um, yeah, Southgate. Southgate is kind of like a pretty academic place, and but if you li live in Wilson, then it's a completely different place, and people just usually leave their door open, so people just go to every uh, every room they want to meet their friends. It's pretty social. It's highly socialized, and uh, as for freshmen, if you're applying to those housings, it's like really based on your own opinion. If you prefer, um, if you prefer quiet, or if you prefer somewhere having a lot of fun, and just follow your own interest and uh, you're gonna have a pretty variety of different experiences right here. Bob, can you mention um, and explain what the focus living is on freshmen in freshman campus? Okay, so focus, it's, it's um, so focus program itself is like uh, interdisciplinary classes combined program. For example, I mean, um, myself is in a focus program is uh, in the last semester, it's called uh, modeling in econ and social science and uh, people who are interested in doing modeling stuff, doing econ and also doing um, so, um, social science, they probably just apply this program and um, they will have like, combined courses all together, which is pretty highly interrelated courses and also very high and also highly inter interdisciplinary. And usually people who apply to the same focus program they usually end up in the same dorm because one purpose of designing the focus program is not just like to expand your interests, but other, but but rather it's to form a pretty um, dense, um, pretty dense community among the freshman students who share the same interest, and um, they they want those students to gather together so that first first of all it's like. Um, easier for the students who are taking the same focus classes to, dis uh, to discuss about class materials and to boost their intellectual um, commitment and activity. And also, it really harshly, mm, it harshly improved that uh, you to meet more people and form good relationships and close binds with people who live in the same doors and share the same interest. So focus program is like, um, it's not just like um, academic, program it but it also helps you to meet people and uh, form friends become friends with each other with really awesome relationship throughout the four years and I'll just say I'm still friends with some people from my focus as a senior so it's it's a really really good program for meeting 
Yeah, I, I'd like to echo the focus love too. I did I did the genomes in our lives focus, which is a very biogenetics heavy focus when I was a freshman. And now I'm a public policy major, which isn't exactly relevant, but at the same time, like there's policy work to be done within that sphere. And I still am very close with my genomes people as well. I'm gonna talk now about one of the upperclassmen uh, residential options. So after your freshman year on East, where everyone lives together in random, largely randomly assigned dorms, there's a whole bunch of things that can happen to you. But still, all sophomores and juniors must live on campus. You can either live on West or on Central. I personally live on Central in a selective living group, it's called, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. And within the selective living group on Central, we all live in very nice apartments. So I have my own room with my own big bed and my roommate has his own room with his own big bed but we have the same living room same living area kitchen etc and it's really nice and really comfortable it's very it's still relatively close to everything i can walk to west through the duke gardens which are absolutely beautiful in about nine minutes and i live next to a grocery store that takes food points i live next to a restaurant that takes food points and a bunch of friends still live nearby so I live on Central, and that's nice. Uh, Matt, I think you live on West. I lived on West um, last year and the year before, but I currently live on Central in 300 Swift, which is a wonderful apartment complex that Duke purchased, and you should really Google the Chronicle story on it to see the um, very comfortable facilities that we enjoy. Uh, so it's I'm a senior, and so it's it feels a little bit like off-campus living, but it still is on all the like transportation networks and it's very connected to campus. So um, I will talk about living on West because I did that uh, sophomore year and junior year and loved it. So what, you know, West campus is the Gothic centerpiece of Duke. It is, you know, what everyone imagines when they think of Duke university. And um, it is so convenient to live on West. I was two minutes from the gym. So even in the cold weather, I could just jog on over in shorts to the gym. Um, I was two minutes away from the dining hall, um, and it was uh, just great. So I highly recommend living on West if you have the chance. And y'all are pretty lucky because there's some major renovations happening on campus, and all of our central, well, except for 300 Swift, our central campus housing will be closed by summer 2019. Um, which means that when you are sophomores, you will live on West, most likely, unless you live in 300 Swift, in um, either recently renovated dorms or newly constructed West Campus houses. And that's really exciting because um, it'll be much more cohesive, I think, in sort of the big picture view um, than our current system where Central Campus is sort of this in-between space. It'll be a wonderful setup. and. Um, you won't know what you're missing. Um, I guess I'll touch a little bit on what it's like living off campus. Um, so for your first three years at Duke, you are required to live on campus, um, which is honestly like a good thing because you end up being closer to your friends and life is a lot easier. Um, but then in your senior year, you're allowed to live off campus if you'd like. Um, for someone that has a car like me um, and that likes to cook a lot, or you might just even want your own space like I did, um, it's really nice and beneficial. Um, there are a ton of apartment locations all around campus. Um, I, they know that there are students seeking places to live and there's also like residency students in medical school. So there's really a ton of options. Um, you don't really end up being in like an isolated bubble without friends, um, mostly because a lot of students take that option to live off campus. So apartment building, I think almost everybody that lives here is a senior at Duke right now or is somehow affiliated to Duke. Um, so it's really nice and it, there is like this added perk of, you know, being able to escape campus because by senior year, it's really nice to kind of attempt to adult a little bit before actually having to fully adult in the real world. Um, so I think that is like a big benefit of being off campus. Um, and then the next question, how separate is uh, Haisa, I think there's one more above that uh, talking about how hard is it to double to double major? Oh right, okay. I can talk about um, that if you like. 
Yeah, perfect, because I'm not a double major. Great. So I'm I'm not actually a double major, but I am getting three, quote, degrees. Two of them are certificates. So a certificate, for those of you who don't know, is in between a major and a minor in terms of number of classes and rigor. And they, they're supposed to be very interdisciplinary and kind of combine lots of different things. So I really like them, and I'm a big proponent of certificates. But doing a double major is very feasible at Duke. I think my Why Duke essay, which is part of the application process, took, uh, it was about, it was about how almost 90% or maybe it's 83% of Duke students get at least an additional major, minor, or certificate. So that really appealed to me because of Duke's academic flexibility. A lot of majors are only 10 to 12 of your ultimately 34-ish classes. So it's definitely feasible with some planning. However, just because you can double major doesn't necessarily mean you should. Matt? Sorry, I, um, I'm i a big proponent of only doing one major. I think it's an option that more uh, Duke students should consider because I think that the opportunity cost of not exploring other academic departments and taking wonderful classes from amazing Duke professors is so great that you really have to have a compelling reason to take a second major. So let's say that you're really into cybersecurity it would make sense to double major in something like political science or public policy and computer science, right? Because those work together to um, provide you a skill and then also like a, a theoretical framework for um, the thing that you're passionate about. But let's just say that you are, um, like me, really interested in foreign affairs, but you also want to learn how to write and how to think and get sort of like a classic liberal arts education then maybe just one major is the right thing for you because you can you can really delve in and i've taken probably 12 or 13 classes in my major which is political science with some of the top political science faculty most gifted educators i've ever met um, and some of the most profound thinkers i've ever met and then i've also been able to take classes in philosophy and conservation biology and um, statistics and uh, shakespeare outside of that major. And I'd say that I'm, I'm much better rounded and I can think more clearly um, as a result of that sort of broad education. And so if you're, if you're interested in this, uh, I will commend to you another thing to Google, which is a column I wrote called credentialitis, which I think is a disease afflicting the Duke student body where you that think that you have amazing, to have... That column's thanks, amazing, Thanks, Jackson. Uh, where you think you have to have like three things to be uh, a legitimate overachieving Duke student. And the thing is you really don't. Um, you should pursue the path that's best for you and you shouldn't feel this sort of social slash academic pressure to um, conform to the, the, the checking three boxes thing. Only do that if it really makes sense for you and what you're passionate about and it provides great educational value. I completely agree with you, Matthew. I think that, um, a lot of Duke students come in here being like the top of their class or the top like 2% of their class. And we're, everybody here is like incredibly ex like achieved and wants to do so much. And it's almost, it feels wrong almost to come to a university like Duke and then not major in like a hundred things. Um, but it, it is a very conscious decision to not do that. Um, and to consciously say like, I want to have more freedom to be able to take a wide variety of things. Um, I would also mention that to have more than one major for me really opened the door to study something that wasn't such a big focus at Duke, like fashion business. Um, so when I went abroad, I went to Paris and I studied at a fashion school there called Parsons. Um, and that was really only possible because I didn't have another major and I was able to fit it into my schedule really easily. Um, and it let me kind of explore my interests uh, beyond my major of like international studies. Um, in a way that wasn't very stressful or overwhelming. And it also gave room for taking random classes within like, for example, public policy, which has no relationship at all to what I'm doing in my major. Um, but I really enjoy those classes, so I make time for them. Um, did you wanna say anything, Bob, before we move on? Yes. What I feel is like, um, like one reason why I come to Duke or what's I like, 
Um, one reason why you come to college is to gain as many experiences as possible. And usually I think taking classes and just doing the academic stuff is not only, it's just one part of our college life. And uh, like definitely if you like to learn more stuff, it's definitely like really cool and for it's good for you to take as many classes as you can and to double major or even like I know one person is trying to triple major. Um, but however, like beyond mm, beyond taking classes and academic stuff, do you also have a lot of other resources like for example, extracurriculars. And there are so many other um, professors. They have awesome labs, which provides you the opportunities to become research assistants. And uh, if you're truly interested in doing something really cool and doing something um, that someone, some, some, like nobody has never done it before, so you can join those labs rather than just taking some classes and explore your interest that cannot, and learn stuff that cannot just be obtained in your own classes. So, Everything's so like, um, yeah, it is like Duke, Duke actually gives you a lot of flexibilities of um, academic stuff. And usually those flexibility and freedoms will give you a better chance of experience as much different experience as possible. So just definitely go out and try different stuff. Perfect. Um, so the last question we're going to do um, is from Dana, how separate is Pratt? So Pratt is uh, the engineering school here at Duke. Are they isolated from the Trinity students, which are uh, everybody else <laughs> socially? Um, no, they're not. Um, we do have a meme page where uh, there are a lot of memes about Trinity and Pratt students hating each other. It's not true. Uh, it is a running joke though. Um, the, the Pratt students are always taking the hardest classes, um, which is like, there is like a level of truth in some ways because they do have the most amount of work um, in a traditional sense. <laughs> um, but I don't really think they're that isolated. We do have a separate, like on West Campus, there is um, this area that's called Equad where all of the engineering classes are kind of based in that space. Um, there's usually only engineering students in there, but they have, like a good cafe there that I love to go to and the, the space is beautiful. So I frequent it often and I know other students do as well. Um, they also live like freshman year, you're all mixed in together. So there isn't this sense of like us versus them type of thing. Um, I am also dating somebody that's in Pratt and have since freshman year and he um, has many, many friends that are not in Pratt. Um, I think it's really just kind of what you're interested in studying. It's not really something that, uh, like, separate from the rest of the community at Duke. Um, and I think a lot, Duke has a lot of programs um, and things that they do to make sure that the students don't feel isolated. Just, just to add a little bit to that, so my freshman year, I was, I roomed with. Um, my my, I, my freshman year roommate was in Pratt and we got along great and I knew all of his friends and vice versa. The the distinction is is so minor. It's just the classes you take. Really the Pratt versus Trinity is just a administrative method of organization more than anything else. Trinity or sorry, Pratt has their own special e-ball which is like a fancy prom homecoming like dance. But other than that they are treated the same socially at Duke. They are all equally involved extracurricularly. Yeah, Pratt students, given the quantitative nature of their work, have sometimes more problem sets or tests, but everyone is still, regardless of what they're studying, very passionate about what they do and fills their time productively, for the most part, I would say. So don't be worried if you're a budding engineering student and worried that you're going to be isolated from the rest of the student body because that's certainly not the case. The, it couldn't that couldn't be less true. Like you will spend plenty of time. You you could go a solid six eight months knowing someone and not knowing if they're in Trinity or Pratt. I don't think it's a big deal. I agree. Um, so I guess we just want to thank everybody for watching and coming to see. Um, if you guys have any questions that you didn't think of or we didn't answer, please feel free to message us on the various, on each of our personal um, social handles that are listed below. Or you can also reach out on the um, 
Duke students' accounts. Uh, so the Instagram, Snapchat is very responsive as well. Facebook, Twitter, uh, really anywhere um, you guys can <laughs> respond. So thank for coming. Thanks so much. Have an awesome day. Go Duke, go Blue Devils. Tune in to us beating Pittsburgh at four.